Yeah, no, it's really, really great to be here. It's turning out to be um, in incredibly fun to just talk, um, not just talk, but talk on the conceptual side of stuff. So thank you, Martin, for organizing an amazing meeting. So yeah. Um, so my long-term interests have been in the type two immune response. I'm a helminth immunologist. I'm interested in the, uh, the immune response to large, very large um, extracellular pathogens, multicellular pathogens, metazoan pathogens. Um, and we know that as mammals, we mount um, a type two immune response that is in the very, very broad, and I think I will emphasize this many times today, contrast to the type one immune response that we mount to microbial pathogens. So for single celled microbial pathogens, we mount what's called a type one response. Um, I've included both CLF1 cells and IL-17 in that because Ruslan Metsatov did in a review, so I can do that now too, um, lumping it all together. Um, but it is really a pro-inflammatory pathway. And one of the fundamental aspects of it is that it's very effective at killing microbial pathogens, um, but it also causes a lot of collateral damage in, in the process because of things like reactive oxygen and nitrogen uh, species that are involved. The type two arm of the immune system is actually incredibly um, complex and and far more perhaps complex than we might have imagined just to have a role in controlling and killing worms. And I was fascinated for a long time about why it is it apparently seems a lot more complex than the type one immune response. I'm sure type one people wouldn't necessarily agree with that, but I really think there's a lot more cytokines, a lot more cells. The whole process is is quite um it is quite complex. And my interest came many years ago when we began to notice that at the site of helminth infection, there were very large numbers of macrophages. And yet the in the in the um, um and yet in the um in the textbooks, there was nothing about macrophages. And even till this day, I would say that if you go to a textbook about type 2 immunity, there's not a lot necessarily about macrophages there. And yet they are the most abundant cell type, typically in addition to eosinophils, um, which, um, which you can see there. And just to give you a perspective on size, I'll later on be talking about this particular pathogen. This is a microfilaria, so this is the baby worm, um, but the female that made her, it would you know fill this room, right? So, so these cells are way, way too small to engulf these pathogens. So if they're involved in killing, how are they involved in killing? And if they're involved in um, control of these pathogens. And we, sorry, I should say, we do know that type two immunity is critical for controlling these pathogens, certainly by doing things like expelling worms uh, through mucus production and, and, and through muscle cell contraction and stuff like that. So type two immunity is important in controlling these worms, but what is the role of these macrophages? And that was sort of what dominated um, my career, still dominates. Actually, I've gotten millions and millions of pounds or euros in, in funding um, to ask that question, how do macrophages kill worms? And I have yet to answer that, um, but I continually funded for over 15 years trying to answer that question. So um, so it just goes to say, as long as you have an interesting question, it doesn't matter if you answer it. <laughs> Um, and so one of the things that we did, um, Paul Monk, who was a PhD student in the lab, one of my early PhD students, he's um, now at NIH, he wanted, to, he said, well, if we just do a transcriptional profile of these macrophages, then we will find out what they do. Um, and this was in the early days of RNA-seq and, and extraordinarily expensive uh, to do. And so we actually had very, very low coverage, um, but it was also, it was not at the time, really, all you could do was microwaves, and then then you were fixed on genes. This was new discovery, and we thought we'll we'll find out what these macrophages do. But the genes that showed up as the most abundant genes, these molecules YM1 and realm alpha, were not in the literature. There was one paper on YM1, realm alpha had not even been described, and Pung, whose name is spelled PNG, he's Malaysian, uh, he um, he wanted to call it Pung's new gene, and we had the the um, manuscript already when the people came out describing it as his one, and then what's up from the other um, And now, of course, these these molecules, YM1 and realm alpha, are considered very good markers of type two immunity. Many many labs discovered them at the same time. We believe that's sort of the nature of technology driving science. I think um, se sequencing was becoming very common, and um, and transcriptional analysis was becoming much more common. And so. We found these bunches, but they told us nothing about what the macrophages did because they, we knew nothing about the proteins. The one protein that was known was arginase, which we also saw, but it had, and it had been described as being 
IL-4 dependent in vitro um, by Simon Gordon. But it does illustrate a key point is that these macrophages were fundamentally different from a classically activated macrophage. And, and Simon Gordon called them alternatively activated. And I do want to emphasize, you hear, you hear the phrase M2 a lot. Um, these are M2 macrophages I'm describing, but I keep my terms very defined. I am talking about macrophages that have been activated via the IL-4 receptor. And the IL-4 receptor can signal, IL-4 and IL-13 can signal through that receptor. So I'm talking specifically about what um, Peter Murray described as an MIL-4. It's sort of a subset of an M2 macrophage. Um, because there's many, many different kinds of M2 macrophages. Um, although arginase typically is true of many of them. And arginase really illustrates how these macrophage populations are actually, it's not just, and I should have said originally, TH1 and TH2 are counter-regulatory. They, they oppose each other during T cell development. But also, even at the macrophage level, competition for arginine will determine whether you go down the arginase pathway, which is involved in things like uh, proline production and polyanines, or producing nitric oxide um, uh, to be antimicrobial. So even at the, at the effector cell level, you have this conflict between type 1 and type 2. And, and the, the, the sort of light bulb moment for me was when we did, when Pong actually did some experiments, actually it wasn't Pong, it was, it was for software, but it was another PhD student who did um, a surgical incision. I won't go into the details of the experiment, but suddenly these genes, these proteins, YM1, realm alpha, these are heavily secreted proteins, by the way, began to be um, uh, produced in a context where there was no helmet, there was no known type 2 immune response, and yet we were getting IL-4 receptor dependent expression of YM1 and realm alpha in a purely injury contest. And this was the sort of big light bulb moment for me. Um, which I should include in there were already people who were smarter who had begun to realize because arginase uh, is, proline is the building blocks for collagen, polyamines are food for tissue repair. So arginase, people had already implicated arginase in, in fibrosis at least. Um, and then um, another PhD student lab did a much more extensive RNA sequence analysis as things became more affordable. And we found that genes associated with tissue repair and matrix remodeling were highly, highly expressed in response to IL-4 receptor signaling on macrophages. So this was um, sort of life-changing for me, but it raised this question is why is a response to helmet infection um, associated with injury and care? And I think these are old ideas now, but at the time, um, this was really kind of novel. And I, I actually struggled a little bit to convince the helmet community that type 2 immunity had roles beyond uh, controlling and killing worms. But actually, if you want to thought about it, it really made perfect sense. So this is the um, introduction very quickly because it's relevant uh, to the next part of the talk, the life cycle of a hookworm parasite. And, and these are not rare infections. About a third or a quarter to a third of the population are infected with these parasites and a much, much higher portion of, of livestock. It's a huge agricultural issue. You know, I don't know how many of you have been around here, but we have a lot of Okay, um, are infected with these kinds of parasites, um, and also wild animals are just endemic. And so they have fitness costs. So what these parasites do, and I have to say, I grew up in a country where I was not allowed to ever walk barefoot specifically because of this parasite. So it, they, they are on a blade of grass, they crawl up, they sense your body's heat and CO2, and they burrow through the skin using proteolytic enzymes, and they then get swept into the bloodstream they go to the lung and then they burst through the blood vessels of the lung into the alveoli, into the airway sacs, and they cause this kind of bleeding. Now, I have to say, this is a, a mouse infected with 250 of them. That would never happen in a human. You get a few at a time, but still, there's this physical damage, bleeding in the lung. They then molt, they crawl up your trachea, and you cough, unconscious that you're doing it, you swallow. They end up in the gastrointestinal tract and they begin to see the blood. Um, sorry. And, sorry. Uh, closer to your mind because sorry, sorry, I'm trying to go. All right, others. So, I, like, I think whoever, Toma, I'm also like to move around. Okay. Um, so, um, they they then suck your blood, and and what happens is that uh, is that they that begins to be repaired. You get scar tissue, and they move on. And if you look at the wall of a sheep for example, that's been infected with these, the wall of the sheep is just covered with little pieces of scar tissue where these have found and let go. And it causes anemia, developmental issues. So the my point being, these are damaging parasites. 
And the damage they do obviously has fitness cost. So this made sense now that, that type 2 immunity would, would be important to control the damage. And so all of this really uh, ended up being building a hypothesis um, that, that for me began to make sense about why type 1 and type 2 immunity were counter-regulatory. I had, from the beginning when I began to learn my immunology, I couldn't understand why you couldn't mount a TA for one and a T helper two response at the same time. One kills worms, one kills bacteria. Why not just have both if you need it? When I began to think about it in an, a wound healing context, it made sense. Because what we know about tissue repair, and this is work that really beautifully uh, illustrated papers from Sabina Emming uh, in Cologne, is that for repair to efficiently progress through to tissue remodeling, you have to shut inflammation off. So the whole anti-inflammatory context of type 2 immunity now made sense in the context of tissue repair. And arginase is just a brilliant example of, of how type 2 immunity, a single molecule, um, can have all these effects. So and I'm not going to don't have time to go through all the mechanisms, but arginase is profoundly anti-inflammatory through its ability to, to remove arginine from, from the system. Uh, as I said, proline production um, and polyamine production are, are critical for tissue repair. And, and um, some beautiful work from, um, I'm blanking on her name, um, uh, has shown that the metabolites of arginase are directly toxic to nematodes. And so what I think has happened during the course of evolution, and I can say whatever I like because you can't prove me wrong, um, is, that, um, is that when we were first exposed with whatever, whatever we were before we were human or many things, but when we first were exposed to these metazoan pathogens or parasites, we saw them as damage, as physical in, uh, injury. And we tried to repair that damage to maintain our fitness. But over evolutionary time, we developed, we evolved those same pathways or adapted those same pathways to actually control the worms themselves. And it's something that has come up here several times. It's not sterilizing immunity. We, you don't, almost no one with any of these sections, you completely get rid of the worm. You're bringing the numbers of the worms down to a level where they're not compromising their fitness. And I think the exact same mechanisms that are involved in tissue repair um, have been co-opted to actually uh, uh, control the numbers of, of, the, of the pathogens. So uh, this hypothesis has been described in a few reviews um, so that I think TH2 immunity responses evolve from innate repair pathways. Um, and it's, it is definitely involved in both helmet control uh, and tissue repair. Um, and in the midst of this, um, uh, uh, oh no, I mean, what I was gonna say is that um, this is a paper that came out from um, Ruslan. And of course he always has these kind of brilliant views on everything. And this was his description of sort of the difference between type one and type two immunity. And I think, I think it fits with what I've just said is that the type one immunity is an essential response to a life-threatening um, those are not his words. This is my adaptation of his, his what he says in this paper, is that type 1 immunity is an essential response to life-threatening loss of structure. We, we, we're willing to take on the damage that type 1 immunity does, because if we don't immediately kill those pathogens, they will kill us. Whereas type 2 immunity is a bit different, a bit slower, um, and that's, that it's needed to restore loss of function. Um, so... So one of the things that we, this is Tara Sutherland, who was a postdoc in my lab. She's now um, a, a lecturer in Aberdeen, um, asking, so YM1 is a, pro, a molecule that my lab's been interested in for a very long time. It's made an enormous abundance in type 2 context. It's also made in non-type 2 context. I don't have time to talk about that today. Um, but we wanted to ask the question, was it involved in tissue repair and worm killing? And I'm we don't know yet whether it's involved in worm killing, but it's definitely involved in tissue repair. So if I had time, I could give you a whole talk on this molecule, this evolutionary fascinating family of kinase like proteins. Um, I was thinking about this with plants yesterday, and so in plants, but don't have time. Um, so, but we think it's a really good model for a human molecule called YKL40. It's not the direct ortholog, but it's a molecule that has many, many similar properties to YM1. It's also a cognate block that is structurally very similar. And the properties of these proteins is that they're lectins. Sorry, I keep walking away from the microscope. Um, and they bind glycosaminoglycan. So uh, they bind the sugars that are part of our extracellular matrix. Um, and so we use that, that, that model I just showed you of a hookworm infection. The one in mice is Nipostrongulus. Well, it's actually rats, but we adapt it to mice on Nipostrongulus resiliensis. And Bill Goss had shown 
a, a number of years ago that you need these alternatively IL-4 receptor activated macrophages uh, to repair the damage that is done in, in, the, in the lung. So we said, is YM1 involved in that, in that damage? Um, and this just shows what happens in the nephrostrongulus immunologically. You get a massive neutrophilia as the worm come, bursts through into, into the airways. But that resolves just as the type 2 immune response begins to progress. Um, sorry, as, as the type 2 immune response begins to come up. You also get really damaging lung injury that's caused by the neutrophils as much as the worm. Uh, and then that resolves. And that's that resolution is dependent on this type 2 response. And this is just what the, the red down here is just what the, what the bowel, um, it, it, you know, the fluid. And this resolves and, and the wound heals. Um, and so what Tara did is, is um, we didn't have the YM1 knockout, we have them now. It's a very long story about why that was so difficult. Um, and we have a big publication on what YM1 does innately, but here in this experiment, she's blocking YM1 as this TH2 response begins to develop. So there's lots of YM1 and alveolar macrophages, um, uh, even in the steady state, but it goes way, way up in all the macrophages in the lung, um, that's the red. And then you get realm alpha in the epithelial cells. We originally described it in macrophages, but in most systems, realm alpha is epithelial cell derived, but also IL-4 receptor dependent. So that you this you have this big mounting. I mean, Nipostrangulus is a great model just to see a massive Th2 response if you want. And so by blocking YM1, make a long story short, is that um, is that we that, that the mice fail to repair if you blocked YM1. And what was more amazing is that she took recombinant YM1 and gave it to an IL-4 receptor deficient animal. So an animal that can't properly repair its lung, she could actually repair the lung. So YM1 alone was able to drive repair. Um, so it was very much um, involved uh, in, in repair. Um, I think this fly wants me to talk about something else. But anyway, um, this way. Um, and so... I have a few of these sort of you know slides that have a lot of data in them, and I don't have time to go through all, all the data. But I think that this concept of TH2 immunity being involved in tissue repair is we are really just at the very tip of the iceberg of understanding all the mechanisms through which TH2 immunity regulates repair. Um, one thing I forgot to say earlier is that importantly, an alpha receptor deficient animal will repair. So it's not that IL-4 receptor signaling is essential because I think to repair your wounds is too essential, right? We have the, the pathways that allow you repair are very redundant. I think what IL-4 receptor signaling does is it changes the nature of the repair and accelerates that repair. And we know it changes the nature of it. And this is just one of the examples. What we, what from work from Sabine Emming and, and Tara sort of together, we know from a couple of different papers and we think it's predominantly IL-13. Uh, drives macrophages to produce YM1 and maybe realm alpha, and that drives realm alpha production by epithelial cells. YM1 itself is what's driving realm alpha. That drives fibroblasts to produce um, a protein, uh, well, the gene Claude 2, which produces the protein lysyl hydroxylase 2. Lysyl hydroxylase 2 is a cross-linking enzyme that causes um, collagen to cross-link in a particular way. You find a lot of it in, say, cartilage. It gives you a stiffness uh, to tissue. Um, and so it, it it causes sort of rapid repair, but also probably drives scar tissue. It's also very important in new blood vessel formation. So so basically, type two immunity here is regulating the whole repair um, process, and that's and we're really beginning to work at the sort of mechanistic angle of that. And I'm always encouraging PhD students to you know work in this area because I think we have just so much more to discover. Um, and don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of this, but it basically I, I am, I, I've become really almost obsessed with the idea that IL-13, and I also don't have time to show you data, but that IL-13 is really a master regulator of regulating the extracellular matrix. I've just talked about the work that, that Tara did here, but we've known for a long time that IL-13 drives collagen production by fibroblasts and macrophages, drives TGF beta activation, which does all of those same things. Um, we know it drives mucus production. Um, that's very well known, which is part of the extracellular matrix. And then recently we've shown that IL-13 drives the production of hyaluron and a very, very long uh, glycosaminoglycan that drives pathology in COVID-19. So, so I really think that IL-13 is this, this master regulator of, of the extracellular matrix and therefore is determining probably the nature of the tissue repair process. So this, um, this 
image, I think it's illustrate this is nepostrondulous ideas. You've got the damaging and the neutrophilia comes in. And I've just described how IL-13 activated macrophages probably are involved in the remodeling and building of the intercept um, of the of the extracellular matrix. But as I said earlier, one of the things that you know really well described by Sidney Hemming is that to get from here to here, you have to stop inflammation. And so part of this whole process of tissue repair is to suppress inflammation. And control of inflammation is essential to move from this early containment through to the building of the, of the, of the extracellular matrix, both the provisional matrix and then eventually the full remodeling. And one of the things that's been said for many, many, for many years, and there's lots of interesting data out there, is that IL-4 is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Um, and so that would fit with the idea that IL-4 or IL-13, I sort of use them interchangeably since they use the same receptor, um, is, is, is important for this step. But that raised um, a problem, which was how can type how can type 2 inflammation be anti-inflammatory, right? It's clearly inflammatory. You have huge number of increases in numbers of macrophages. You have huge increases in numbers of eosinophils. It is an inflammatory response. And I really struggle with this term inflammation. I think we all have to be careful how we use it because there's very many different kinds of inflammation. Um, and yet we always talk about inflammatory versus anti-inflammatory. And, and to to, to we came across this, the, what I think is an answer to this question, uh, really inadvertently, um, when we were working on what are actually my favorite parasites, the filarial nematodes that cause diseases like lymphatic filariasis, oncocerchiasis, and as I only discovered recently, mancinella uh, causes um, a huge number of infections worldwide, uh, but because they cause little pathology, they're much less well known. So these are the human pathogens, and we use a mouse model uh, called Lipisodes sigmodontis. Which, like Mancinella, the parasite lives in the uh, in the serous cavities, um, and so this is this is a picture. All of these parasites are are vector transmitted. In this case, it's a mite, um, and the, the two this shows two infected larvae in the skin. And this parasite doesn't cause a lot of physical damage, although we're having changing ideas about that. It's a very motile parasite, but. When it, to get into that lymphatic vessel, and there's very cool movies by an ex-postdoc, Simon Babayan in my lab, they actually, the, the <laughs> lymphatic vessels have valves to like slew it in, but that they're way too small for a worm. And so the worm literally bangs away at the vessel until it breaks and then goes into the lymphatic vessel and then gets swept. And it ends up in the pleural space. This is um, James Parkinson in my lab, uh, who really an amazing guy, uh, without even asking me, went to our small MRI system, and I didn't even realize that, that, that we had this, this, this pearl of fusion. And I've become really interested in the pearl space another, for another day, an area that really changes every time you have lung infection, but we don't really study. So this is the, the, the fluid around your lungs that helps you breathe. Um, and Pleural effusion is very, very common in, I think anybody clinical will know how common it is, but we really don't understand a lot about the immunology of it. And the worms sort of hang out down here in a bundle and they're incredibly motile. They're thrashing around and the males and females are having sex and producing babies that circulate in the bloodstream. But one of the things that I really loved about this model is that there are susceptible and resistant strains. And so C57 black six mice are resistant they both in both cases you get full establishment of infection, but by about day 40 or 50, they well, by probably around day 35, the C57 black six mouse begins to kill its worms. And you never get the sort of the worms never reach sexual maturity. And so you never get circulating microfilaria. Um, uh, and they get caught up in this granuloma, which has a lot of macrophages in it. The valve C mouse goes on to develop a patent circulating um, infection. And what I really don't have time to talk about a lot today is we think this is a good model for a good, as good as maybe these can get. I'm not saying it's a perfect model uh, for human disease where um, we know that the C57 black six mouse kills its worms. It's dependent on T helper two cells. Um, and that's very like people who are constantly exposed but appear not to be infected. Whereas people who have circulating microfilaria in the bloodstream tend to not be ill. Um, and that we see as sort of the, the biopsy. And that involves something I don't have time to talk about today, a really strong regulatory environment in, in the biopsy mouse that turns off the T helper 2 cells that are needed to kill the worm. 
But one of the other major differences between the strains is that the C57 black six mice have vastly more of those macrophages that I showed you than the bowel food mice. So, uh, and this literally every dot is an individual mouse, so lots of experiments in the lab. Um, so this raised a question, which I said, this is what I've been asking uh, granting agencies for a long time without answering, um, is do macrophages kill nematodes? Are they the central, are they part of the the central players in this. Um, obviously, they can't engulf them, but we can imagine lots of other ways they might be involved in controlling macrophages. So what we decided to do um, was to get rid of the blood monocytes because everybody knew at the time, we talked about a lot here about dogma that gets sort of in the field, the dogma in the field uh, 15 years ago was that all tissue resident macrophages or all macrophages in the tissue were derived from our, the bone marrow. So all we had to do was get rid of the blood monocytes and we would then block the incoming macrophages. And then we would ask the question, does do that, does that kill, do, are they involved in controlling the worm numbers? But when we did that, blood monocyte depletion had no effect on the macrophages at the site of infection. I mean, for us, this was completely bizarre. We could see that every monocyte was gone. The spleen was practically gone. And yet we, we still had this huge increase in macrophage numbers at the site of infection. It just made no sense. Um, and, and this was work that was done by Steve Jenkins in the lab. And I think, once again, much of my life, and I suspect many of you, uh, you know, when things have gone really well, it's when the plan didn't succeed and you deviate um, from the plan. And I think from one of the most exciting things about science is, is serendipity and actually being prepared for it. Because I will never forget sitting um, in the office with Steve trying to decide what we should do. We could easily just now inject quadrinate or something into the pleural cavity and get rid of the macrophages. Maybe we should just ignore what is probably some strange artifact. But we decided not to. Um, it was just too weird. And what, what Steve could see was that the macrophages in the um, naive animal had this tissue resident population. And as infection went on and a number of macrophages increased hugely, phenotypically, it still just looked like a tissue resident macrophage. Whereas if we injected an inflammatory stimulus into the pleural cavity, we got a classical inflammatory response. We got the recruitment of neutrophils, and then we got monocyte-derived macrophages. And then this is really important for later on. We got a the, mac the, the resident cell population disappeared. This very well described macrophage disappearance reaction. Um, and then as time as that resolves, the macrophages uh, come back. And of course, as many of you will know, at the same time as all of this was happening, once again, huge serendipity in science and why we made a big splash uh, in publishing this is because at the same time, people like Frederick Geisman and Paul Hu were discovering that in fact, macro tissue resident macrophages were not monocyte derived in many tissues and that they are there and they're established in your tissue before you're born and are maintained by self-renewal. So you don't need, you didn't need monocyte recruitment. Um, and these, this, so I'm, I'll be talking a lot about large cavity macrophages, which are the tissue resident. They're dependent on a transcriptional factor called GATA6. Um, and they're maintained by self-renewal. It's not because it's, a, I, I confused somebody. I realized they gave a whole talk and the whole room was confused. So I avoid it this time. I'm not talking about a large cavity. I'm talking about a large macrophage. So, but it's the large cavity macrophage and the small cavity macrophages. It's the size of the macrophage, not the cavity. Um, anyway, so the small ones are the ones that are monocyte derived. They're F480 low and, and they come in and they're monocyte derived. And you have these two populations. And this is, this is in the serous cavities, the pleural or the peritoneal cavity. But in fact, it's probably it's just that the concept is true in most tissues um uh, and what we know now is that even though these are self-renewing from the prenatal form as an animal ages and this is true in the serous cavities as well slowly this population gets replaced from the bone marrow with age and the consequences of that are not fully understood um so we have this situation in which, uh, I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll probably, you know, be hitting this home a lot, that we really have this really fundamental difference between type 1 and type 2 immunity, is that in a really pure type 2 response, and, and I think that I, we were incredibly fortunate, once again, serendipity, the C57 black 6 mouse is profoundly, in this setting, I know other people will have issues with this, but in this setting, the C57 black 6 mouse in the pleural cavity is about as pure a TH2 response as you can get. People who work on schistosomiasis, which is considered the biggest to look at this data and say, this is just pure TH2. Um, and, and so we were very lucky and we were 
radically expanding this resident cell population. That story has changed a bit, as you'll see in a minute. Probably much more common in a type two environment is you do have monocyte recruitment. And we know that any cell that comes in can be triggered to alternatively activate and proliferate. But in a type one environment, this cell population disappears through the macrophage uh, disappearance reaction and these cells become activated to kill bacteria. So fundamentally very different. So then the lab moved from Edinburgh to Manchester in the midst of all of this. Um, and my lab was like, why? <laughs> You're moving from somewhere cold and a bit sunny to somewhere cold and quite wet. Um, but, um, uh, but it's been a great move and actually a lot of new people. And the per person who's, uh, this is um, Connor Finley who really took on the work that I'm, I'm gonna talk about next. Um, and so, we really decided now that we had all this new knowledge about macrophages, how might this apply to our understanding of susceptibility and resistance in, in this model? Um, it, could it all be explained because by these differences? Um, and this was work that had been started by Sharon Campbell in, um, uh, in, in Edinburgh, and then, and then Connor took it on. And, and Connor had wrote which is now under second review at Immunity, the biggest paper my lab has ever, with the most, not the biggest, the most data rich paper. And I'm gonna try and summarize it in a couple of slides, um, uh, but involved amongst many other things, single cell analysis of what was going on. Um, and just to emphasize, we know that this resident cell population requires retinoic acid, which is produced by mesothelial cells to drive this GATA6 transcription factor, which determines the residency phenotype of, of this macrophage. Um, and so he did single cell analysis, and um, I, I could show you a lot of flow cytometry that matches this beautifully. Then what he saw was really quite interesting is that in the naive animals, um, oh, it's one of these things where it's jumping ahead and doing things. Anyway, um, uh, in the naive animals, you have this resident population. I don't, once again, have time to describe. There's a lot of difference even in the naive animals between the two strains, which is another big issue I have that everybody uses C5756. Um, but in the, in, in the UMAP uh, transcriptional space, when you infect a C57 black six, you get literally that's doing it without me touching anything. Oh, well, um, you get this um, population, this resident cell population, which is exactly the same population. It's GATA6 dependent. It has all the residency markers. Oh, don't do that. Um, but the um, but it's taken on all these IL-4 receptor dependent genes like YM1 and RELF alpha that's caused it to shift in the UMAP space. In the bowel of sea mouse, you have the resident cell population and it's still there, but in much reduced proportion. Um, and instead you now have a lot of monocytes and a lot of what um, are these converting uh, macrophages. And once again, tons of data from Connor, um, both using bioinformatic um, trans, uh, projections of what would happen, but also lots of experiments on, on monocyte transfer and everything to come up with what we, I think is a fairly accurate model of what the difference is uh, in part between these strains is that in a C57 black six animal, monocytes do come in just like in any normal animal at sort of a steady state level. And I don't have the data to show you, but the rate at which they come in is the same in a naive as an infected animal. And they, go through this converting population and become tissue resident, but it happens so fast, the conversion happens so fast that we really don't see any of these converting populations. Whereas in the bound sea mouse, the monocytes come in and actually I think a lot more monocytes, almost inflammatory monocytes come in and they go into this converting population and they just stop. They can't go through to this tissue resident population and they begin to accumulate. They also have a much more pro-inflammatory uh, a phenotype. So the question that we decided to ask was, are these strain differences, are they are they macrophage intrinsic or are they the, the, the result of the tissue niche? And um, in the macrophage field right now, people are kind of obsessed with the niche and it, everything is the niche. You know, it's every tissue is different. And I, and I don't disagree with this, I should say. That, that every tissue has a different set of signals that drive that resident phenotype. Um, and in, in the serous cavities, peritoneal and, and, and um, pleural cavities and cardio um, and pericardial cavity, it's this mesothelial derived retinoic acid is one of them that drives this conversion uh, into a resident population. Um, but we couldn't see any obvious differences between the strains in that, but we still assumed that the difference would be the niche. 
So Connor did one of his hundreds of heroic experiments, and one of them was to make a bone marrow chimera. So we transferred, he used B10D2s, which had the same, same, same MHC as valve C, but phenotypically are the same as the black six in terms of every way in terms of this infection. And, and the bottom line was only if you had um, bone marrow from the black 10 mouse, could you get this expansion of the, of the macrophages? So it looked like it might be macrophage intrinsic rather than niche intrinsic, which we, we were a little bit surprised by. But then we noticed something else. I always say we, but it's like the royal we. I didn't do this, but anyway, we did this. Um, so uh, what, what Connor did is he saw that in fact, we only got T helper two cells, the data down here is more specific. We only got T helper two cells if we had uh, bone marrow from the black six mouse. So you needed black bone marrow to get this T helper two cell expansion that was part of the black black six. So, so that really raised the question for us: Is it not the is the niche not so important? Is it actually the adaptive immune system that's important? Um, and this summarizes a huge amount of data where Connor blocked T cells. He uh, blocked their recruitment from the lymph nodes. He blocked T cells specifically. He blocked, in this case, oops, I'm just doing the jumping ahead thing. Um, he blocked um, uh, um, dendritic cells that drive a T helper 2 response. Every way, which way you could think of, he prevented T helper 2 cell expansion at the site of infection. And what that did, and as well as knocking out the cytokines themselves, is we just failed to get this transition. We failed to, if you need, didn't have IL-4, you didn't get this transition. And if you didn't have IL-13, you didn't get this transition. So if you didn't have T helper 2 cells, you just don't get this population. So what it showed and I know I really don't have time to explain all the data really thoroughly, is yes, IL-4 and IL-13 drives expansion through proliferation of this population, but it's also T helper 2 cells are also absolutely required during infection, not in a naive state, to drive these incoming monocytes into this resident phenotype so that it can now become um, alternatively activated. And I say that because they are also much more prone to become alternatively activated. So, so, it was a case about, and I, for me, this has become something that I'm trying to, I think the adaptive immune system can come in and override We do what the innate system does in the steady state. And as mouse immunologists, we spend a lot of time studying naive animals. Um, and I think the adaptive immune response can come in and override a lot of that. So what I think, I, what I think it is, is it's another example of where Type 1 and type 2 immunity are really fundamentally different. So you have a steady state situation where these cells are maintained by self-renewal. You then get a type 1 response and these cells disappear. And then you have the macrophage disappearance reaction. And I think if you think about that, that makes sense. This is fighting a microbial infection. It might be a chronic intracellular bacterial infection. The last thing you want is a resident-like macrophage, which would be a nice host for a bacterial infection, right? So you get rid of that. Interferon gamma is profoundly anti-inflammatory. I'm sorry, not the opposite. It's profoundly anti-proliferative. So it really blocks the expansion of macrophages. Instead, it converts all the incoming monocytes into these antimicrobial phenotypes. Under a type two situation, and once again, the model we're having is probably an extreme type two response. You just have this sort of steady state trickling of monocytes that's happening all the time. And those are rapidly converted into um, a tissue resident macrophage population, um, which still requires retinoic acid. It still requires the niche. And then that gets expanded um, quite, uh, quite a lot. So it will go back to the steady state as well, whether it's the same steady state. Um, and this one will go back to the steady state eventually once everything's resolved. So then. The next question that we wanted to ask was what happens if you don't can't make that conversion to tissue residency? And this was this is brand new data that just shocked us. And I think it's quite exciting and how this it takes the, the story a bit further. So from from Gwen Randolph, we got the GATA6 blocks to mice so that you don't have GATA6 in the macrophage population. So you cannot get this resident population. So here's the wild type mouse. It's essentially gone in the knockout mouse. And now we can begin to look like a valve C mouse, but we're getting a huge accumulation of monocytes, monocyte derived cells, this converting population. 
but we're also now looking at a big inflammatory response. We're now getting the, we're now getting neutro, a big increase in neutrophils, as you can see uh, here by by Cytoff. So we blocked that ability of TH2 cells. The TH2 cells are still there, although now they're changing as well in this environment. We blocked their ability to drive that cell into residency. And now we're getting a pro-inflammatory response. So um, to try and summarize all that, another um, fancy picture that I won't go into the details of, but what we, I think that IL-4 and IL-13 drive the expansion of a tissue resident population that, that is actively suppresses inflammation. And I think we've known for a long time that type 2 immunity is sort of non-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, but I don't think I was even prepared for how actively anti-inflammatory it is. We've known for a long time, and this is from a review that I will hopefully come out next year. It hasn't been reviewed yet, but I was asked to write for annual reviews of immunology. So this picture sort of is just illustrating a lot of the mechanisms by which um, IL-4 and IL-13 reduces inflammation, but almost all these mechanisms are involved in suppressing inflammation, not actively blocking it. So I think we still have a long way to go to understand how type 2 immunity is suppressing that. And then as I've discussed already, also this same pathway is regulating the extracellular matrix. So I think type 2 immunity is doing these two completely essential parts of type 2 immunity. I say essential, but we can they can be done by other things like TGF beta as well, which does both these things as well. You, you, you know, IL-4 is suppressing inflammation, which is allowing repair to progress, uh, and then is regulating the extracellular matrix. They're probably not happening in the same space and time, and they may not be exactly the same macrophages. So for the last, and I'm right on time, for the last five minutes, um, um, I want to talk about um, this concept. Uh, you know, all of this that I've been describing to you um, I, I think there's another big factor. And I think that type 1 immunity takes evolutionary precedence over type 2 immunity. Back to that statement of Russ Lenz. One is life-threatening. The other is about function. So you have to deal with a, a, something that's life-threatening um, first. And these, this concept and idea was one that a, um, Andrea Graham, um, uh, who is, I think, I've already suggested if you want someone who is a brilliant conceptual thing, uh, thinker, um, an evolutionary biologist who came to work with me and Andrew Reed um, at Edinburgh many years ago and changed the way I think about lots of things. She came in with this idea and we did a lot of experiments with malaria and filaria. You heard from Miguel about Shibodi. We did a lot of experiments and I think uh, those are published many years ago that support this idea um, that that. You, we, we prioritize a, a pathogen that's going to kill us, a type 1 pathogen over a type 2 pathogen. And this is just the last couple of data slides um, is work that I've almost forgotten about. We Dominic Rucarell, who is, a, um, is independent now, but was a postdoc in the lab, we published this in pathogens a few years ago. I got back to it recently, and I think it really tells us a lot. So this is a different infection, but it's a, it, it is the same in the sense of what I did. It's, it's a gastrointestinal nematode infection, but in the peritoneal cavity, you get exactly the same of what I've been describing you, this massive expansion of the tissue resident population. So you have this massive expansion of the tissue resident population. It's alternatively activated. It's realm alpha, YM1 positive. It's all there, we think, to protect the gut from potential uh, breach um, uh, so what happens when you infect uh, that situation? So we, we give the, the, the H. polygyrus infected first. By day nine, you've got this massive macrophage, alternatively active by the IL-4 receptor activated macrophage population, and you give salmonella. And what happens is salmonella wins hands down. So you have this huge macrophage population, and then what happens is that you get... Um, uh, this is macrophage disappearance reaction that I talked about from a naive to if you have salmonella alone. And when you co-infect, salmonella drives the macrophage disappearance reaction, getting rid of, of all these alternatively activated macrophages. And instead, you now have almost an equivalent level of monocyte-derived cells. So we were really worried that maybe we'd gotten the dose wrong. And so um, uh, Dominic did a, a, a dose response of the inoculum. It may absolutely no difference whether these animals were pre-infected with this helminth or not. The, the bacterial load was exactly the same. Um, and then as your, um, as your infectious dose increased, you began to lose this F480 high tissue resident population and the amount of the monocyte derived cells just came in. And the remaining, as this population declines, 
these remaining tissue resident populations convert. They start making uh, inducible light nitric oxide synthesis, and they begin to make neutrophil chemoattractants. Mm -hmm. So the whole system changes its efforts to fighting that bacterial infection um, over, over the Helminth infection. So to summarize sort of everything I've been saying so far, we think that IL-4 and IL-13 both suppress inflammation and regulate the extracellular matrix. Um, and that I've written a big, well, as I say, review on that. But one of the things about that review is that these pathways are so redundant that it's hard to prove the specific role often of, of IL-4 receptor, because if it's not there, other pathways will step in. Um, then, as I've also talked about, this idea that, that type 1 immunity is when, is when it's a more life-threatening um, um, problem. Um, and, and, the, and the consequence of that is something that Andrea proposed many years ago, that type 1 immunity uh, will take precedence evolutionarily over type 2 immunity. And I'm not going to go into this slide. Ooh, that's done a weird thing. Anyway, wow, it's done a weird thing. Um, I have uh, like a whole other talk on how IL-17 plays into this and how regulatory cells play into it. But since it messed up, we won't talk about that at all. And I just, uh, I have an amazing, amazing lab. Um, who really do all the hard work, um, and I get to use the royal we. Um, I, most a lot of what I've talked about today um, was was Connor Finley's work and supported by this amazing guy, uh, James Parkinson, um, and Brian. I have to give a shout out to uh, Brian Chan. He, he looks Chinese. He is Chinese, but boy, does he have a Scottish accent. Born and bred, oh, just gifted everything um, uh, in 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 Scotland. Um, he runs all our life cycles, which is really a uh, really challenging. So I will stop there, even though it's trying to move my slides around. Okay, thanks very much. So we have a lot of uh, more questions, so we got these. Uh, um, uh, thank you very much. It was awesome. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh, and, uh, I had uh, several questions, but I will reduce it. Uh, first, what comes to my mind is uh, that uh, basically we see a huge amount of fibrosis in the uh, context of cancer and uh, in the context of very serious cancer, uh, which is uh, which is uh, with gets cachexia and reduces prognosis and other things. And um, we also know that uh, there are huge shifts in uh, microbiome of such cancers and uh, that uh, mycosis and uh, other other kinds of pathogens that are usually physiologically found in, in bodies uh, uh, appear. Uh, so I want to uh, know what is like your take on uh, what is the cause, what is the what is you want me to explain all of that? <laughs> um, uh, so I think I need to repeat the question, I think, or did, I don't know if people online, did people online hear that? So, okay, so I'll take two questions. So, so the fibrosis, I didn't even touch on fibrosis, but of course the, the end stage consequence of too much of this type two mediated repair is fibrosis. Um, and, and once again, like wound repair, I, I think that IL-13 and IL is really a major fibrosis driver because it pushes stuff down that pathway. But TGF-beta alone can drive fibrosis, but IL-13 drives TGF-beta. And then in the context of cancer, you've got the classic you know, as we already heard from Toma and everything, you've got the classic thing where you actually haven't resolved the inflammation. So, so, so the process is failing, right? You're getting the buildup of the extracellular matrix, but you're also not controlling the inflammation. And one thing I didn't talk about, but we're really interested in in Manchester, that's what happens in chronic wounds, right? These people that were trying to repair it, they're laying down matrix, uh, but they also aren't getting rid of. And I think that's largely probably often driven by the fact that the infection hasn't been controlled in like a diabetic wound or that sort of stuff. Um, so, but then the other question is the microbiota. Um, yes, of course, that's going to be a player in all of this. And, um, you know, the worms that I'm talking about, the, the, the filarial nematodes live in the tissue, but I'm sure they're influenced by the lung microbiota. They might be influenced by, I wouldn't hesitate to think they're influenced by the gut microbiota. We know that these worms are massive regulators of the microbiota. Typically, they do, when they do that, they actually regulate it in such a way that they promote regulatory environments, right? Because the worms 
don't really want a Th2 response or a Th1 response. Neither of them is good for the worm. So they tend to promote a very strong regulatory environment. And that is often microbiota mediated. But I have, we have not looked in this model. All I can say is, yeah, we, we could, but we haven't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, let, let, let's let me first take a question from Zoom Miguel, the question, and I'm going to uh, write down the, the heads here. So, Miguel, uh, go ahead. Julie, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. And uh, it's beautiful to see this progressing and uh, getting more and more complex. Um, I have two question comments. The first one is about the, the wording of uh, anti inflammatory. Mm. Why don't we call, uh, why don't we agree to call these different types of inflammation as you so well described that the response to these elements is an inflammatory response, but it's geared for the specific aim of dealing with these huge beasts that are destroying tissue. So can we, can we I, call that an inflammatory response rather than anti-inflammatory? Yeah, I, I I would agree completely. It's it's how do you change a whole literature, right? And um and so in a way it's anti type one inflammation, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. and and I I don't I don't know the right words to come up with that um, because because in some ways it is anti inflammatory in the sense that inflammation is the you know in one definition is the response of vascularized tissue to damage. And so that is the influx of cells. And it is blocking the influx of cells, although not, not eosinophils are, are coming in. But you're right. I, I, if I could find the right terminology, I would. And, and in this review I've written, I've actually addressed just, just that point. And actually, Ruslan also tries to address it, that inflammation is just too vague a term. Um, so, yeah, I agree completely. I don't know the best way to say it, that's all. Me neither. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm definitely not going to lecture about that. But but what about what about if we would call it like for adaptive immunity, type one inflammation, type two inflammation? Uh, it, it might be too restrictive because it, it might be broader. Yeah. Than, uh, than the adapt but there might be a, a beginning. I don't know. But yeah. it's something worth thinking about, probably. Yeah. The other thing is more. Um, I was going to say more down to earth, but perhaps not. <laughs> I always see, uh, when I see your slides, I always get all excited, and uh, especially when I see your Eppendorf tubes that are all red, and then I see the lungs, this huge hemorrhage there, mm -hmm. right? Because these, these parasites go through the lung, super vascularized. They, they probably break in microvasculature. We get red blood cells everywhere. So I always ask this pathway that we work on malaria, uh, which is... Uh, macrophage centered CD163 with a with the hemoglobin receptor and then catabolizing him. Did you ever did you ever see signatures of this? Uh, and do you think this type of pathway would contribute to tissue repair? I do think, but I want to I want to <laughs> get your opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I'll answer it at a high level rather than a detailed question because I can't, I'm not sure I can go into, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, but I do think that it is, that type 2 immunity is very, very tightly um, uh, tied to the, to control of the vasculature, right? Okay. And, and that the cl that clotting mechanisms, I mean, we're just beginning to work on this, but, you know, platelet factor four is one of the factors that's driven by these macrophages, that, there, that there's a very, very close interaction with platelet function uh, and, and IL-4 uh, activation. And, I, and I'm saying high level because I can't, you know, we don't know the details yet, but I, I, I think one of the most important things that type two immunity does is regulate bleeding. And it's well, just, yeah. yeah, and I just, I don't, we don't mechanistically know how that is, but it's very, very clear in these models. And when we, um, we just see a lot of bleeding in our IL-4 receptor deficient. So I don't want to monopolize this, but I, I cannot stop myself from thinking of this. You know, these macrophages, when they start taking up red blood cells, they produce a lot of carbon monoxide. Right. And carbon monoxide is interesting. Uh, because it's uh, it's it targets mitochondria, 
and it really shuts down the metabolism. So I wonder, I wonder how parasites would react to that. But anyway, I'll. Yeah, I'll that's see. interesting. Of course, the IL-4 massively drives mitochondrial biogenesis and the electron transport chain and everything. Yeah. It's a yeah. major mitochondrial driver. Another whole thing that we don't have time to talk about. But yeah, yeah. Thank Thanks. you very much. Yeah. All right. So Tamar. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have one question related to the work of Sabine Emming. I just wanted to know what is known about, and, and of course your work, uh, what is known about the connection between common infection and repair mechanism across the tree of life. So, the, so uh, she's been interested in MTB and CIDO. And because you make that strong connection, yeah. sort of what came first, what is known about that? <laughs> Um, I'm trying to think, you know, I mean, the, the, the area where it's probably best studied in a completely different system and, and back to Sophie's talk yesterday is in plants, right? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, plants very quickly, you know, wall off and encapsulate and, and do, but if they also have an anti-inflammatory connection, uh, yeah, it's a great question. I, I really don't know. I, I have to I have to think about that. I mean, maybe someone else has an answer. But, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna uh, maybe ask this in this in this context. Um, so maybe the life histories can play a role. I think uh, Russell has kind of, like what so what's the magnitude of the inflammation, and you know, depending on the life history, we can uh, uh, assume um, that uh, uh, those that have short lifespan, for instance, and high replicated traits, are more prone to induce more inflammation than those uh, long uh, late, uh, uh, species where uh, tolerance would be, uh, uh, would be the, so I don't know if the, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that might be true. The only issue that I would have, you know, I like thinking about plants because they're also very long lived, right? Um, but um, I, I would think that even a short lived creature, uh, too much Type one recruited inflammation, um, I won't just say pro-inflammation, uh, um, is, is gonna be really damaging, right? And it'll kill you instantly, right? If, if you start making a mass, if you're a C. elegans and you started making massive amounts of, of you know, oxygen species, it, it, but maybe, I don't know if C. elegans does that. I don't think, you know, so maybe they have much more restrained and maybe, maybe the answer is that depending on the life history of the, of the, of the animal or the species, the magnitude, as you say, of, of inflammation changes because maybe we can afford higher magnitude because we can control it. If we're, you know, I don't know, I'm getting way out of that. Well, then the argument is that they need, because of the short lifespan, they need to get rid of that because they, they, they really find problems on those. Stuff. Yeah. So, so, so that's why it prioritizes, it would like prioritize like one inflammation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, at least that's the argument. Uh, yeah, yeah. Russell. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly true. They don't need to spend a lot of time rebuilding their tissue if, if yeah. that's going to. I mean, one of the fascinating things about tissue repair is that remodeling phase can take weeks to years, right? Um, so you're not going to bother to evolve all the remodeling pathways if you're only going to live two weeks. So just, uh, if I made a closer example, is the uh, you know, amphibians that regenerate. It yeah, seems yeah. that their type one immune response is is not very good, not very high. And this is you know this is one domain where knowing more about the yeah, kind yeah. of element they get could be very interesting for your hypothesis. Yeah, and in fact, um, a lot of those uh, you know um, animals that regenerate, it's well described that it's an M two type macrophage that's absolutely essential for that limb regeneration. Yeah. All right, so Mihai. So beautiful, fantastic story. Uh, one question regards the disappearance of, of the residents type to uh, macrophages when you have a bacterial infection and so on. What do you think is happening? Do you think that they are just overwhelmed percentually by incoming cells, or do they change their phenotype, or do they undergo apoptosis? What, what do you so, think? So that, you know, so I, you know, um, a year ago I would have said we really don't know, but I think they're. I think it's a little bit of all of the above. So uh, Gwen Randolph has a beautiful paper to show that um, the macrophage disappearance, in, that you get a, a fibrin clot in the serous cavities. Now, this is just probably maybe unique to the serous cavities, but you get a fibrin clot and the macrophages are in that fibrin clot. And then that will get cleared. They'll die and they'll get cleared. They also, some of them disappear and go into things like the omentum um, and probably die by apoptosis. And then, as I said, the few remaining ones actually convert at least partly to a more classically activated phenotype. And once again, this, this 
uh, type one, type two evolutionary paradigm really works in that those macrophages can flip and start making INOS, but the reverse doesn't work. So if you take a classically activated macrophage and give it IL-4, you can't make it go the other direction. They go, they're they quite happy to become activated. So it's a long answer, but I think the data is coming out. And what's fascinating, once again, back to Miguel's question, is that is that, that fibrin clot doesn't appear to have any, any platelets in it. So it's almost like the macrophages play the role of platelets in that serous cavity, but they are caught, the macrophages all get caught in a fibrin clot and then get cleared. Yeah. All right, so that was next. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for a uh, wonderful talk and uh, amazing. For me, it's like um, showing how um, uh, immune defense can be mediated by uh, by repair, by uh, maintaining integrity of the tissues. Uh, but I was wondering the following that, uh, so one role of uh, TH2 cells uh, in all of this process is to eventually activate B cells and to, uh, uh, to induce production of antibodies like are these IgE antibodies that are produced? So I was wondering what these antibodies are doing there, and if they also, I don't know, participate somehow in this repair process, or what, what, how, how does it fit into this, this framework? It's a great question, and, and and partly, I mean, and that's a question I always kind of dread, yeah, because because it's true, of course, type 2 immunity drives this huge antibody response, which in part, those antibodies, so remember, part of what I said is that it is to control helmet infection, so a lot of those antibodies are very effective, uh, the IgE antibodies in particular are very effective at, at stopping incoming uh, larvae, right, so that's one one function. Whether they're actually involved in tissue repair, there, there is there is a paper on that, and I'm kind of forgetting, but I think it's, and when I, I said to you that it's IgE predominantly, but of course they are also driving, IL-4 is a major, uh, it's a different set of cells, the T-follicular helper cells, but they're also driving various IgG production um, as, as well, and what the actual role of those is in repair. But what's also becoming clear is that type 2 immunity has, uh, and the antibodies involved, have a major role in protecting us against things like venoms and uh, and you know snake bites and and that sort of stuff. And so so once again, I think that although it doesn't quite fit the wrestling because those things are quite life threatening, but there are animals that are repeatedly uh, bit by snakes, and then every time they're much less likely to die, um, and they can just actually be. Um, you know, really handle it. And it, that's all type two IgE mast cell mediated. So, so I think there, I think it's a great question because I don't think it's that easy to, to bring this whole model in with the antibody, but I, I have to work on answering that question better. <laughs> yes. So there was uh, Jan. Yeah. Uh, thank you for great macrophage centric question. <laughs> I was like in missing the mast cells and whatever. Uh, my question is that all the data and experiments in a particular time snapshot is a result of interaction between the host and the pathogen, and the worms are so efficient in immunomodulation. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what is a clear picture of the immune response and what could be modulated by the, by the host? Because it would be very individual, uh, including different different parasites, and it can somehow change the change the interpretation. What is the crystal clear coming from the host, and how it's modulated more or less by the, by the particular parasite? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I'm fully getting, I'm just gonna quickly, I mean, what's actually happening in the valve seamouse is something that may may sort of address that, is that we know the monocytes are coming in um, and they get stuck in this converting population and they turn on, PD, IL-4 turns on PDL 2 So that is the host doing it in a protective way. And that PDL 2 turns off uh, the T cells, the T helper 2 cells. And so those T helper two cells, they're still there, but they no longer make type two cytokines. And then this, this animal becomes susceptible. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but there are massive numbers of regulatory pathways. And of course, all of these worms, and it's not host, so it's not as, they all produce, they produce TGF beta homologs, they produce molecules that interfere with IL-33 cleavage. The other thing we have to forget, not forget, is that these worms have genomes almost as big as our own, right? And 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 they devote an enormous amount of, of 
energy to interfering with the host immune response and downregulating it. And when we study things like nimbostrongulus, it's not a natural parasite. Um, uh, you know, it's this, it's in and out of the host in four days. I mean, that just doesn't happen in the real world because the ones that are established turn on these massive regulatory pathways, probably back to the original question in many ways to regulation for microbiome. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Um, so the question was, what, what does the parasitic and what does the, 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 the host well, in, I, the, in the data you're... So. Yeah, I, so we really, so that, that's, yeah. So in this case, what is the parasite? So the parasite, for example, makes a lot of these chitinase-like proteins, which may interfere with the function of YM1, but we haven't studied that. So they make so many molecules that could be involved in interacting with the host that that in and of itself. So I you know, was a postdoc in Rick Basil's lab, and, and that is really the whole direction of his lab is really understanding the specific molecular interactions between the parasite and the host. And it's it's just ripe for discovery because every time you look, these parasites are making something else that specifically modulates the host response. Yeah. Yeah. So the other is young. Yeah. I would just ask uh, about T Rex. Yeah. Uh, so, also inhibit this TH2 reaction and then one deep breaker or they support it? Um, so, I, I think that in the, in the helminth model systems, the T regs are um, typically suppress the TH2 response, right? right? And there's a really nice paper. I'm not sure it was published yet. I just saw it presented, really showing mechanistically how T regs really regulate TH2. Having said that, T regs can make things like TGF beta and stuff that are very pro repair. So, and maybe it comes back to the idea that these that it may suppress TH2 immunity, and therefore, you know, also back to the cancer question, it may suppress some of the worst fibrotic outcomes of TH2. But T regs are still themselves important for tissue repair, right? So. It's a hand wavy answer, but I think it. I think T regs are very effective at suppressing TH2 immunity, um, uh, but they themselves can contribute to repair. It's that kind of hand wavy. Well, I do a lot of hand wavy. So it's really, well, there are uh, three questions now. So there is our first. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I, my question probably holds up on what. Uh, I'm sorry, can you take your mask off? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> my question probably holds up on what uh, which, uh, he was asking, and that's about the uh, that the TH2 response leads to huge um, IgE production. Yeah. Um, so in the sensitive individuals, this can lead to allergy or asthma development. Yeah. And there's this um, hypothesis that uh, uh, the rise of allergies and asthma is connected with us being too clean yeah. in society yeah. that you don't get into contact with parasites or infections in that. So is there something um, that uh, is, the, is it about like some kind of epigenetic reprogramming of TH2 that is then more active or is it about the processes that rather regulates the TH2 as well? Of course, I'm sure there are epigenetics regulation processes, but I think that the easiest answer to that sort of hygiene hypothesis side is actually directly related to the other questions we've just been having um, is that these parasites don't in a, in a, a, a a normal, successful, chronic helminth infection, they're not mounting very strong TH2 responses. They're mounting very strong T regulatory responses. And so I think that one of the ways in which helminths reduce allergy is that they, that they, that you end up having a much higher T reg environment, natural T reg and everything else. And the, the, what's interesting about that is that's also true of a chronic any infection, chronic viral, chronic bacterial, you'll eventually begin to mount strong T regs. So I think that that one of the reasons we have this massive increase in asthma and atopy is that we're no longer exposed to infections and dirt and other things that that we that we learn to not respond to them because responding too much is is tissue damaging. So we respond to them just enough to maintain our fitness. Then we live in a world where we don't make those responses and we see a bit of pollen and we just respond through the roof because we don't have the regulatory mechanisms, partly to reg, probably lots of other regulatory mechanisms that might involve epigenetic changes. They're just not there because we're not exposed to these things that help us not overreact to these pathogens. So we start overreacting to anything, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much. It was wonderful talk and really inspiring. Yeah. Uh, I was very intrigued by the data on the single cell sequencing. Yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, this uh, classification different populations of macrophages. 
Ali mentioned this experiment with uh, the bone marrow transplantation. So uh, I don't know if I didn't get it or it's going to be the paper. I don't know. It's on bio archive if you want to look. So, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't get like if you already uh, look at uh, the differences between uh, these uh, two um, strain, like you know, from the bone marrow perspective, if there is already like you know, some differences uh, or it's the tissue, like you know, that you know, so that's a very major feature of the paper. So you could go. So we don't look at the bone marrow per se, but there's a whole section. Um, and once again, because we've submitted it to immunity, we have to sort of cramp data in half of it's in supplementary as in so far. But um, but it, there are major differences in that monocyte derived. Well, actually, that's not really true. In the naive animals, so no infection, no type two. There's major differences between the strains in that tissue resident population. The monocyte derived populations are not that different, but the trajectory is the potential of a bout C mouse to move to residency is much lower than the potential of a C57 black 6 to move into residency. So there are fundamental, almost certainly epigenetic, well, maybe genetic, who knows, differences between, between the two strains. Yeah. Yeah. It's also like, you know, some signals that are coming from other issues, like, you know, to activate the bone marrow, like, you know, exactly. exactly. Well, and that's a whole other area because, of course, these infections drive systemic cytokine changes that go back into the bone. And we, uh, John Granger in our department does a lot on, on that. And, you know, both the type one toxoplasma versus these kinds of infections massively change the, the, the bone marrow and, and how these cells develop in the bone marrow. The questions are never ending in that context. I mean, we will never ever answer everything, which is great, which is how you can keep getting funding without answering the question. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Dominic, just a short question, a truly wonderful story. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, is there any role for embryonically derived macrophage, tissue macrophages that are there? Or they are just there and then replace them? Uh, so I think that that is a fundamental question that the field has not answered yet, right? Because what you need, and, and now we begin to have, and I've just, I've just emailed Florent um, Ginhu um, and he's gonna send me the mice. You know, we need the ability to track which cells were embryonically derived and which ones came in from the monocyte and then see if there's a functional differences. And of course he has this MS4A3 marker, which tells you, so we can look in our, we can look in our resident cell population and we can say, these guys came from the bone marrow and these guys didn't. Now we can do that with, uh, with fancy bone marrow chimeras that we do all the time, but, but we can't on an individual cell level distinguish the two cells. Mm -hmm. And so with his, in principle, what we could do is we could actually get rid of all the cells that are monocyte derived uh, and then say, what's the difference function? But I don't think it's a question that the field has answered and there's quite a bit of argument. Some people, because they transcriptionally become so similar, right? Mm -hmm. That people say it doesn't matter what the origin are. But of course, I think it will matter to some degree, right? Yes. Do you see any difference between bouts and black seeds in this compartment? Um, so I'm trying to think whether all our chimera work to look at the rate has all been done in C57 black six, and we don't have current markers to be able to say in this comparison which one is more um, which one is more resident, more embryonically derived than the other. So we don't have that answer. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, so I've, I've, I've seen three questions in the room, but unfortunately, we are a little bit uh, out of time. I want to take a uh, chance to uh, read a question from Zoom because uh, otherwise, this cannot be answered uh, during the coffee break. So, uh, great talk. Thank you. Why did you use Salmonella to evaluate uh, the co infection and not others, uh, not other type 1 infection, uh, infectious triggers? Does the choice make a difference? Well, I'm sure it does make a difference. Um... So as in, I think anybody will know in science, you do what you have available to you in the lab, right? So when we were in Edinburgh, we did co-infections with this filarial parasite and malaria because we were working with Andrew Reed and colleagues. And then when we, uh, when we were in um, Manchester, you know, salmonella was what somebody else was working on. I mean, it, it really just came down. And, and I think the other reason we chose salmonella is that, I mean, we, there were others, we could have used E. coli or something, but salmonella is, is a really profoundly interferon gamma dependent pathogen. So it really is a type one, it really needs type one um, mechanisms for control. It's almost sort of, you know, a, a classical model of, of TH1 mediated control. So but it was really it was really opportunistic as much as you know, yes. Mm -hmm.
All right. So the rest has to to, to wait for the break. Uh, thank you again.